Hello and welcome. I'm Sue Palmacon, aka The Divorce Doctor, and I welcome you to Heart to Heart with The Divorce Doctor and Friends. Whether you or a loved one are considering divorce, in the midst of it, or coming out of it, this show is what you need to listen to. Divorce seems to affect everyone in some way. It can be an overwhelming life event, not only for the person going through divorce, but also for friends and family of those divorcing too. We're here to walk the path with you, bringing you specialists who can help you make better decisions, provide you with resources, and give you ideas about how to be your best self in a time that, quite frankly, can bring out the worst. And today I'm so excited to be here with two amazing women, Terry Creedon and Sonella Lukanovic from the Grounded Parents Group. The Grounded Parents Group provides personal development opportunities for parents, providing a sacred space where parents can come and focus on their own growth. The focus is on the parent, not the parenting. Yes. Yay. Thank you so much for Thank agreeing you. to come. I'm really excited to hear about your programme. So if we just start off with a, f a few questions, okay? So... Yeah. So many parents going through divorce get lost in the divorce process. How can they honor themselves? Mm, so important. So important, right? Because as you said, it's labeling it as a divorce process makes it think that we've got to tick along like a conveyor belt through all the things that need getting done in that process. And, and that's what happens to us when we go through any sort of a, a struggle in our life. You know, we basically start going into doing mode and solving mode. And, um, you know, look, when a divorce comes, it's, it's a laundry list of things that need taken care of. It's, you know, maybe household things, maybe it's financial things, maybe it's the legal matters. Um, there's just a long, long list. And you just sort of start attacking it to try to gain some semblance of control. And a divorce, a divorce in, in coaching perspective, is what we would call a break in transparency. You know, your life is sort of going along, along mostly transparent to you. This is not something you're thinking about or worrying about because it doesn't need any attention. You know, the, the marriage is, is just kind of moving along for better or for worse. But then when the divorce time comes and the, the decision is made, you have a break in that transparency. And now what was transparent to you is like right in front of you and you start sort of problem solving. And so the number one thing to put on your doing list is to take care of you, Absolutely. right? That, that self-care, um, and for, for us, it's beyond self-care. It's not just taking care of yourself. It's um, self-awareness. Can you get in touch with some level of self-awareness that can see you through this journey in a healthy way? So for us, it's, it's the oxygen mask analogy. Yeah, Put your own oxygen mask on first, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's such an emotional time for everybody. You know, you, you mentioned self awareness. How how does that play a role? Mm. Yeah, yeah. I I think um, when when you when you talk about that um, analogy of of things breaking. Um, we when when we face that moment uh we forget that as well as being a parent we are a person uh and and i and i like to see those two things as side by side and what happens is that this person who is going through this very difficult time that person has to be seen has to be acknowledged, has to have the time and space to figure out what is and, and, and honor what is going on for them. And that includes that sense of, you know, the self-awareness of what they are going through and making time for that, making time to go into understanding the emotions, understanding the, the consequences, because let's face it, when, when something like this happens, everything that we have planned for ourselves yeah. is now gone. Yeah. And that is a hard place to do. But what we often do is we sort of think that this person somehow will come, you know, will take care of her later. 
because the, 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 the role of the parent is calling for us. All the stuff that Terry just talked about, they're external things, you know, they are coming at us. You know, there is no, there is no mm. choice. There is no kind of thinking, oh, you know, shall I take a, a phone call from the solicitor? Or shall I, you know, park the conversation with my child who is in distress? We don't have, you know, that's coming at us. Whereas the, the, the awareness piece, the sort of taking care of me piece uh, is a choice. And that is something that we, um, we kind of neglect to do because we think we can just drive, you know, indefinitely on whatever resources we have. Um, I mean, we have this analogy of, you know, driving a car, like, you know, you sit, you know, this, this divorce is a, is a process. It's like driving from London to Manchester or London to, to, to Edinburgh. Like, and it's a long ride, yeah. but we do not, we kind of think, oh, you know, I'll just push through it. I'm not, you know, I don't want to stop and re, re, refuel there or, you know, put a petrol in because, you know, I can do that later. But whilst we, whilst we are driving, we are constantly stressing, am I going to break down? Am I going to run out of, of fuel? And that is that self-awareness piece, that self, uh, self-care, building the capacity within ourselves to do the role of the parent, to do the role, uh, you know, and to do the role of, a, you know, whatever is coming after this, uh, you know, we, the process that we are going to, uh, through. So in essence, we have to take care of ourselves in order to build our capacity. Without capacity in that person, that person cannot do, cannot do the job of a parent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is that is the biggest shift that we see that people have to make. And I don't know what's your experience when you work with people. It's I, I find it can be really hard for people to prioritize that um, themselves because yeah. it's like, oh yeah, it's gonna happen. Uh, and then we are making it really stressful and very hard for ourselves. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is, in a, in a marriage, you lose your own identity. You become somebody's wife, somebody's mum. Mm. Coming out of that marriage, it's finding out who you are. So yeah. that's all part of the, the new self-awareness. Oh, you've definitely. got to find out who you are in your own entity. Oh, that, that is, yes, yes, absolutely. Spot on. And, and that is, that is pro- that for some people, that, you, that, that is a beautiful... Um, awareness that for some people that might be the first time that they have found the time or they have they, they've been forced to kind of think and who am I mm. because we you, you, yeah that's beautiful because we so readily adopt and move you know kind of um, move into these roles and those roles are just part of of who we are yeah yeah mm. and that, that's that's part of my fresh start is actually defining your new identity you can become whoever you want to become yeah and live the life that you choose absolutely absolutely and the amazing part is that you always could you always could have done that even within the marriage yeah (laughs) you don't think about that no no yeah Yeah. and that sorry no i was just uh, the, the the i find it helpful to to think that we are doing that for ourselves and um but in this at the same time our the work that we put in ourselves and in building that capacity um is is the you know we are also giving permission to people you know to our children to people around us to also move on so that we do not collectively get stuck in in this what was or what could have been so that work on, on defining your new identity, mm. just thinking where, mm. can I, where can I go from here and defining my you know, new me or um, re, reawakening parts of yourself that you might have um, kind of left, left dormant for a while. All of that, that sort of work gives a strong message to everyone else that we can go through this and we can come on the other side uh, as as a as a new entity, as a new you know new yeah. revived, refreshed. Um, yeah, 
Well, it's, like, it's acting like a, a role model for, the, for your children to show them how you can solve problems, how you can cope with conflict, how you can come out the other side stronger. Mm, absolutely. They're watching. They're watching yeah, how you navigate it. Yeah. But the thing that we don't do is we don't reach out for help. So, <laughs> you know, why is that so difficult? Yeah, that's the million dollar question, right? Why is it so difficult? And I know how difficult it is. It's the It was the first stop on my self-awareness journey. And I didn't even know that was going to be a stop for me. I mean, when I entered into self-awareness, um, you know, in, in this personal development space for myself years ago, I had a laundry list of other things that I thought I needed to sort out and work on. And the first thing that my coach called me out on was, you know, always being the helper, never allowing people to help me. Mm. And I just, I just didn't even realize it or see and how overwhelming that was for me, never asking for help. So um, why don't we do it? I think we, it goes a little bit back to this identity question and identities that we take on mm. based on our own worldview, our beliefs around what society says we should be as a mom, woman, um, dad, parent, whomever in this world, we often hold the belief that I need to be strong, independent, capable, um, have it all together. Mm. And these identities and, and the need to hold on to those identities will prevent us from reaching out for help because reaching out for help has an identity to it or a judgment attached to it that then somehow you're weak. And there's a little bit of a paradox there because if we are willing to help other people, right, when they need help, um, but we don't want them to help us because we perceive needing help as weak, then somewhere subconsciously, we are judging the people we help as being weak. We are holding that within them. We can't hold the belief differently for them and for us. And, you know, when I realized that, I was like, oh my goodness, I need to shift this, you know, and break this um, belief that, that asking for help equals weakness. In fact, it doesn't. And it is a courageous act, but it's also quite important, you know, who we're asking for help. Are we going to the right people? Um, and it brings us to the second point. We, we often, when it's a, something like divorce, why we won't ask for help is because there's so many emotions attached to a divorce, right? You're, you're feeling guilty. You're feeling um, overwhelmed. You're feeling anxiety. You're feeling maybe some judgment. And personally, very often inside, there's the emotion of shame. And shame is just that belief that we are not good enough or ready enough or prepared enough or resourced enough for this, that not enoughness, that emotion is powerful. It's shame and it's what keeps us silent. So this comes from the work that Sanella and I are certified in around um, Brene Brown's research, where she speaks about shame as being something that wants to keep us in the closet. It wants to stay hidden and in the dark. And when it's in the dark, you keep it in the closet, it grows and it grows. I always tell my clients, it grows like little shame babies mm. and it just gets bigger and bigger. That unworthiness, that, that negative self-perception just starts to get really, really big. And you, you don't want to show that to somebody. You don't want to reach out and say, Hey, look at what I'm, look at what I'm struggling with here. Mm. So the fact is that that emotion keeps us quiet. It prevents us from shouting out and saying, Hey, I'm in here. I need help. But in fact, it's reaching out to somebody who can be our supporter and provide us with empathy that actually calms that growth of shame. So, you know, Brene will call empathy the antidote to shame. And it's, it's just a paradox because it's the last thing you wanna do, but it's the first thing you need to do when you're in a shame storm is mm -hmm. to reach out to somebody you trust Right? You don't have to go and share your hard stories with you know, all of the other parents at the school gate or you know, the parking attendant at your, <laughs> at your car park at work. Like, you, know, you, you share your story with the people who have earned the right to hear that story. Mm. 
and receive empathy from them. Yeah. Oh, I, I can totally relate to that because I know when I was going through my divorce, I didn't tell anybody for a long time because I was the first one of my group mm. to, to get divorced. And I didn't even tell my mum yeah. until after the decree nice I came through and when I did tell her she said oh thank god for that she said I knew there was something wrong I thought you were ill yeah oh she could tell <laughs> yeah moms know moms absolutely. know okay. absolutely yeah but that is such a um and I see that a lot so it's just just to pause to acknowledge how um how we take on the, the we have we have our own feelings and we have what we are going through and then people around us so you mentioned your mum and and I see this uh, in with other people where your parents people you are maybe hoping to get support from they can be triggered in their own sense of shame and you know this should not happen to us and therefore yeah. they may not be the people like people who you kind of think might you know should be in your empathy uh you know should provide you with with empathy may not have the capacity for that mm -hmm. and and i think that could be heartbreaking for people uh, but i think you know when we understand and accept how shame works as, as terry just described that that it, it, you know we need to um we need to be able to to extend generosity towards people like like that and understand that they are also navigating this change and the fact that they are not there for them for us does not mean that they do not love us it just means that they are in the they might be gripped in their own shame storm and their own narrative around what is happening so yeah. it is really important that we can step back and say, who are the people out there that I can go into and talk to uh, who will not judge me, who will witness me, not try to fix me, because we don't need fixing. We just need witnessing and we need that non-judgment to, to, to be able to process what's happening for us. I think that is, um, that it's, it's a very complex and, and um, we need to acknowledge that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's so important to look after ourselves. So, you know, as we said before, if we don't look after ourselves, we can't look after others. So how can we practice self-compassion without feeling guilty? Oh, wow. Mm. Oh, if you didn't only put that, <laughs> that tagline on, <laughs> without feeling guilty. Without feeling guilty. And um, I, you know, this the same way, you know, Terry talked about... Um, asking for help was such a kind of unknown entity for her self-compassion was exactly that for me mm -hmm. um, and I am still surprised every time I talk about it that I'm the actual person talking about it because I believed very strongly that when things are tough when when I'm facing hard times that the best way forward is for me to sit myself down and tell myself how horrible I am and how I messed up because that would motivate me to go for, forward. Uh, and it wasn't until the, the research that, uh, you know, from Brené Brown, from Kristen Neff, um, that, which is over, you know, quite, quite overwhelming now that, you know, that is not the way forward. Um, and, um, the there is uh, I'll, I'll i'll tell you um in terms of uh, divorce um there is a study from the university of arizona where they looked at self-compassion and the impact it has on our long-term well-being and um, so they they looked at uh, at at the people who were going through divorce and those who practice self-compassion were much better equipped to deal with the consequences of what they were going through nine months after the divorce happened. So, so they, they experienced uh, less, uh, less decline in self-esteem 
uh, they've experienced less decline in the optimism and, and uh, overall positive feelings. So I think when that knowing this research helped me to remove the guilt because being self-compassionate is really supporting yourself through difficult times from a place of care, not place of fear. Yeah. And the, the, um, the, way, the way we do it, and it, it's, it's really to treat ourselves as we would treat a best friend. Uh, and, I, and I always have that in mind when I talk to myself, would I say those things to a person I love? Would yeah. I say this to my child? Mm. And if the answer is no, then I have to reframe it. Um, and and the, the, the other, the, the second step in, in self-compassion is to, to connect with a common humanity of what we are experiencing. I mean, I looked up at the, at the statistics of, in the UK, the divorce statistics, they say 42% of marriages end up in divorce and that was in 2019 so there is definitely just in the uk there is definitely a, a massive common humanity like you know this is not happening to 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 just to me it's happening in in our society but when we are triggered by shame the shame once whispers to us it's just you like what you said for you know for your divorce it's like you know i was the first one and I could not share it with people. And, and some people uh, who are out there going through that, if they are the only one in the family, then they will take that and project that, like, you know, I am the only one in the world. So we really have to challenge that and, and, and con you know, connect with the, you know, there is, I always say to myself when I, when I struggle to, <laughs> to, to be self-compassionate, I say, you know, out of six billion people, you know, there must be one out there who is facing the same thing as I am facing. So, you know, there is a there is always a common humanity in there. Um, and and the the last thing that kind of maybe people struggle with, you know, when thinking about self compassion and what causes us to feel guilty about it, is that we feel that you know, once we you know, if we allow ourselves to be kind that somehow we'll be stuck in this, like, you know, wallowing and, you know, oh, poor me and, mm. you know, but that's not self-compassion, no. that's self-pity. Yeah. Uh, that is also a very isolating experience. So it's very opposite of self-compassion. Self-compassion requires mindfulness. Self-compassion requires the, the sense of, I am feeling this, but I will go through this. And this is where we practice got you know the, what we talked earlier about the reason we stop and take care of ourselves and and process what's going on for us it is that we can move through it and we always we are humans we are wired this is why we survived and why we are here and dinosaurs are not uh, because we are able to move through uh, our, our struggles yeah i always say don't throw a pity party throw a divorce party <laughs> Great. <I> like that. <laughs> and you, you said about 42% of, of marriages breaking down. Mm. That's overall. If you look at people in long marriages, mm -hmm. you know, people over 50 going through divorce, that that percentage goes up to something like 56%. Okay. There are oh, more wow. and more over 50s now looking and thinking you know the children have left home mm. I've got the next 20 30 40 years with this person that I don't know and I don't know I don't love mm. Mm. and then if you look at people going into second or third marriages the statistic goes up to something like 67 percent for second marriages and 83 percent for third marriages mm. so People are taking the same mistakes yeah. through uh -huh. to the next marriage. And that's what, yeah. you know, why marriages break down. They you know, we really need to work on the self yeah. before we embark on another relationship. Yes. 100%. 100%. Yes. Do you want to tell the story of... Um from from our from from uh, rising strong workshop where 
um, what we often find that people discover in this process, we, we, they discover a lot of patterns. When you stop to think uh, yeah. about yourself, uh, do, do you want to tell that story? Yeah, well, I think it, it, it goes to the, the, next, the next point, Sue, that um, we, we had spoken with you about before in terms of, you know, how do you, how do you move forward? How do you, yeah, yeah. how do yeah. you move past it and not just survive this break in transparency as we're calling it? How do you thrive beyond it? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's critical that we do, you know, not just the self-awareness and reflection on our emotions during it, but that after the divorce is finalized, sometimes things start feeling a little lighter and people think, okay, great. You know, the paperwork's done, the legals are done, the finances are sorted, it's, I'm moving forward. But without taking a pause there again at that point to say, wait, what happened there? We're gonna move forward with either, uh, you know, a barrel of lies that we've been telling ourselves about our, how we're not worthy enough or lovable enough or, you know, prepared enough or, you know, independent enough or strong enough, whatever those not enoughs are. Um, or we're going to continue to repeat patterns as we were just saying, right? So I know that um, when some of my clients have come to me to work through, we use Brene Brown's Rising Strong process, and she, it is this process of reflection after the fall. Um, and timing is critical. It's, it's not a reflection process that's really easily done during the fall, right? So when you're face down and you've decided to get a divorce, you, you don't just open the book and say, okay, I'm going to go through the rising strong process and, and move through this. You know, it, it's going to take time. And sometimes you just need to stay face down for a little bit before you can process how you got there. Yeah. But so afterwards, when things start feeling lighter, you go back and reflect on what was the initial story I was telling myself when I first realized there was a divorce coming? You know, all of these not good enough messages, um, maybe all the, the misbeliefs I had as to why this was happening. You know, he or she wasn't this um, and I didn't do this and um, I never was able to X, Y, Z. Um, and all the, the blame we engage in, blaming self, blaming others. But if you start pulling that apart and really have somebody, a coach or, or a good friend, go through that story you're telling yourself and reality check those messages, yeah. you get to a, a very clear truth that, you know what? I was never really asking that my needs got met in that marriage. Mm -hmm. And therefore I got myself to a very unhappy place. I was in a very unhappy place. And because my partner was with somebody who was so miserable, they weren't happy. And it was a whole cycle that we were both, you know, kind of co-conspirators of. And it wasn't just one person's fault. And what are my patterns? Why don't I ask my needs to be met? And you start uncovering, well, I've been doing this since childhood as a result of whatever needs I was requiring then. And if you don't sort that out, as you said, you're going to carry them forward. So we need to do that reflection. Um, we need to get honest uh, with our stories so that we walk forward with the truth and mm. it won't change the fact that we've been through a divorce and it was hard, mm. but it can change how we show up in the future relationships and, and what sort of story or message we take away from that first marriage. Um, mm. you know, what, where, what place does it hold in our life going forward and can we hold it in a place of learning? And not a place of failure or suffering. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's absolutely critical. I know I was very much, you know, in my first marriage, I'll walk in your shadow so that you can shine. Mm. So it never felt like a partnership with my new marriage. Well, it's not new anymore. It's 16 years old now, but oh, yeah. <laughs> it still feels new and exciting. Oh, wow. Nice. Um, you, you know, we said right from the start, you know, it's us. It's not me and you. It's us. And so, you know, we're each other's biggest fans, each other's biggest supporters. Mm. Although I always say that Bill is the wind beneath my wings because I seem to have fly higher and higher and higher mm. 
because you know I've, I, I've, I'm a different person, completely different person. Mm. And I know when I was at my ex-mother-in-law's funeral recently, I overheard my ex-husband saying, well, she's not the, she's not the girl I married. <laughs> and I thought, no, I'm not, but I'm the woman you divorced. Uh-huh. What a the one that got born. Um, and, and do you think, uh, Sue, is, is um, what, what got you, what helped you? Because your journey is beautiful. You, you have achieved that rebirth you have it seems to me you are designing you have consciously designed the new you Mm. oh absolutely absolutely I mean when I look back I don't like the person that I was in my first marriage I you know I I always had this ability to to really thrive and shine in me but I was too frightened because I was almost, it was almost a, a sense of being grateful that he'd, he'd chosen me to get married to. Because when he was young, he was absolutely, he was like a Greek Adonis. Mm-hmm. And I, I was, you know, I've always thought myself as being a, a plain Jane, you know, hiding the, hide the background. But once I got divorced, I thought, no. I've got ambition, I've got the ability to shine and shine I did because I went, I got my first full-time job in 20 years and within five years I went from junior lecturer to senior manager. Now, where did that come from? Making up for lost time. (laughs) Exactly, because when I started working part-time after I had the children, I was I was told or when I was talking about applying who'd want to employ you mm-hmm. you know you've been out too long mm. I'll show you <laughs> and I, I think that is that that sort of narrative is exactly what we what we need to stop and and question because you you were intentional about uh, and you were driven with with you know what seems to me like a bit of a you know I'll show you um, uh, a- attitude to to reach to 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 question what was given to you and I think when I when when I talk to clients around you know who are going through difficult times it's it's really important that we bring to surface all of the limiting um, messages and beliefs that mm. are given to us and they're not always easy to spot sometimes they you know well oftentimes they come from the conditioning that is that has started much earlier than our marriages much earlier than you yeah. know conscious to 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 do anything about that so um and it's so nice to hold the stories that you are sharing here uh, of, of people who have gone before you because that shows us that it is possible. And we see that all the time in our work. Yes, I I love that advert that's on the television where there's a a couple meet after several years and he he says to her, miss or missus? And she says, no, doctor. (laughs) (laughs) I love that. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant. So... It's been absolutely fantastic. I've loved our little heart to heart. Yes. So how, how can how can people get in touch with you? Uh, yeah, they can find us at our website. It's uh, groundedparents.group. Um, and also on Instagram. We're, we're present there quite a bit, putting out a lot of um, inspiration and content uh, at Grounded Parents Group. So you can find us in either of those places. Great. Now I'll put it in the... Um, the broadcast notes as well appreciate it oh so, i'd you. like to thank you so much for giving up your time i know you're so busy um as well as being a, a certified divorce coach i was divorced myself at 50 as i said and i've been in the same situation as you let me walk down the path with you as your thinking partner thank you for listening today and it's my prayer that this show will help you or someone in your life reach out to us at www dot divorce-doctor 
www.dr.supermacom.com or find me on Facebook or LinkedIn, Dr. Sue Palmer Com.